Okay. So, welcome for the first uh, talk uh, in the series of our so-called Monday seminars. You may have noticed that this year uh, we have somehow reorganized the Monday seminars uh, and we uh, started a new series, a series of seminars or talks of internationally um, famous uh, professors and colleagues uh, which uh, the series takes place every Monday, uh, sorry, the series takes place again on Monday, but not every Monday, but as announced, and we will try to have about five lectures in the winter term and five lectures in the uh, summer term. We have <coughs> uh, started, introduced this series in honor of Professor Fred Jelinek, uh, those who have been with us for a longer time, uh, they may, uh, they, they certainly have met Fred during his stays in Prague. Uh, they also know that most unfortunately Fred died a year ago, I mean a year and a one month ago. And um, we really uh, appreciate his contribution to the study of computational linguistics at Charles University. And we thought that it might be only appropriate to uh, remember him uh, during our school year in these regular seminars. Uh, we are very happy that uh, we start the seminar uh, by a talk given by Professor Joachim Nivre. And not only uh, uh, thanks to our old friendship, but mainly and first of all to his uh, merits and contributions to computational linguistics uh, while in a field which is very close to us, namely uh, dependency and dependency passing. Uh, Joachim Niewer has got two PhDs. This, again, is something which uh, is very uh, kind of, which we, which we appreciate very much because one of the degrees was in linguistics and one of the degrees was in computer science. So he's a sort of bridge between these two disciplines, a bridge which we all would like uh, to have here in our, uh, with our younger generation. Um, Joachim is well known to people who are with us uh, by his contribution, as I've said, to uh, dependency passing. He published a book uh, two years ago, one year ago, uh, on that. He organized the uh, competitions or the project of uh, shared task, uh, also concerning uh, dependency. So um, it's no wonder that the topic of his talk uh, today is uh, uh, also concerns dependency. Uh, independence passing. Uh, if you looked at his web page, you might have seen that uh, Joachim has several uh, personal interests. And he smiles because <laughs> I have said this to, uh, to the audience of the dependency, uh, dependency conference in Barcelona. One of his hobbies is Sherlock Holmes and uh, I said at that meeting that he, I hope that he will uh, take us through the mystery of dependency-based passing in the way that Sherlock Holmes has uh, solved his uh, mysteries. So welcome, and we are very glad that you could uh, accept the invitation, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, for that very kind introduction. And, and thanks also for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here um, to give this talk. And I'm truly honored to be the first in this series of uh, sort of starting off the new seminar series. That's really thrilling. Um, so yes, uh, I am going to talk about uh, syntactic parsing of natural language, uh, which is the task of trying to extract information about the syntactic structure 
of a natural language sentence uh, such that we can uh, infer things about the predicate argument structure. So often this is described as the task of figuring out who does what to whom uh, in such a sentence. Uh, I have a rather mundane example from the, taken from the Wall Street Journal, the Pantry Bank here, economic news had little effect on financial markets. So um, apparently there's the, the news that has or does not have an effect on something. Um, and I am going to be concerned exclusively with using dependency-based syntactic representations uh, in this task. And of course, being in Prague, uh, uh, I don't need to tell any one of you that uh, dependency based representations have a very long and strong tradition in descriptive and theoretical linguistics. Um, but, um, well, I don't know, but, and, uh, in the uh, uh, last perhaps five to ten years, they have also become very popular in computational linguistics or natural language processing. Uh, and. Um, I think there are actually uh, several reasons for this increasing popularity, and I thought I'd spend just one or two minutes initially at sort of saying something about that. Uh, I think one reason why we see a lot more dependency parsing in computational linguistics than we did, let's say, 10 or even 15 years ago, is I think their perceived usefulness in many practical applications. Uh, people who want to build systems for question answering, information extraction, uh, increasingly also tasks like machine translation, clearly find dependency structures useful. Uh, and I think sort of the main reason for this is that they offer uh, a very transparent encoding of this predicate argument structure that I rely to. In a, in a dependency structure, we can sort of in almost all cases, read directly off the tree uh, what are the main arguments of the predicate, whereas in many other syntactic representation, it takes more sort of inference and processing to get this information out. And I think it's clear that um, regardless of anything else, dependency structure has in some sense become uh, an interface f between syntactic parsers and downstream applications. Uh, and this is true regardless of whether the actual parser internally makes use of dependency structures or not. I think a, a, a very good example of this is the, the so-called the Stanford parser developed by people like Dan Klein and Chris Manning, which is a, sort of essentially internally a, 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 a PCFG parser, a probabilistic context-free grammar parser that doesn't use dependencies in any direct way. Um, and but which is very popular sort of uh, by people who build applications, not because it's the most accurate available parser for English. It actually isn't. I mean, there are other parsers that do better, but because it has this built-in functionality for uh, deriving uh, dependency trees from these representations so that as an application builder, you don't sort of need to worry so much about the syntax. You can get these dependency trees out. Uh, clearly, also another factor that has played a large role in, in popularizing dependency representation, uh, dependency-based representations is the increasing availability of uh, syntactically annotated corpora using dependency representations. Uh, and we've seen sort of such resources emerging for more and more languages. And it seems that as uh, the tree banks are developed for more and more languages, it's, it's very common that people choose a dependency-based annotation over other alternative. And it's often been pointed out that, especially for languages that exhibit sort of free or flexible word order, uh, it's, it's often more convenient to use this kind of representation. Of course, the Prague Dependency Tree Bank has been very influential here as a model of this kind of resource. And, and it sort of remains uh, the, the largest and, 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 and most richest of these resources, I think, I mean, for any kind of tree bank, uh, regardless of whether it's dependency or not. Uh, the, uh, Eva mentioned briefly in her introduction the, the shared tasks on dependency parsing that have been organized 
uh, by the Conference on Computational Natural Language Learning. I think that has also been important because it, that has made available uh, a number of tree banks, uh, including uh, the PDT, in a sort of standardized format that, so that it's easy for people to do experiments. And I, I just want to sort of make one little correction there in that, uh, in terms, I, I wasn't actually involved in the organization of the first of these shared tasks, so that credit should go to Sabina Buchholz and Yuval Krimolovsky, uh, Erwin Marcy, and Amit Dubey. They were the ones that started this. I, I got involved a little bit later. Uh, a third factor, and this is of course very much connected to the second one, is that we've also seen a lot of research at developing um, especially perhaps statistical or data-driven models for uh, parsing with these representations. And that has led to a number of proposals for um, robust and efficient parsing methods, methods that are often uh, quite simple, um, which often also means that they can be highly efficient, but which uh, tend to give sort of sometimes I would say even surprisingly high accuracy, uh, at least for some languages. And, and that, of course, is what I'm mainly going to be uh, talking about today. Uh, before I do that, though, I, I, I want to introduce sort of the second part of the talk there. So, of course, as I already said, I don't probably don't need to dwell on this very long uh, for this audience, but... Uh, just to remind you that the, the basic idea in dependency syntax is that we assume that syntactic structure uh, essentially uh, consists of relations between lexical items. Uh, and these are binary asymmetric relations that we call dependencies. Uh, and you also know that this, the basic idea has been developed in different ways, in, in different theories and frameworks. So there are a number of different, but that are sort of based on this but by and large, in most of these, it is assumed that this network of dependencies form a, a tree structure of sort of the, the, at least as far as the shape is concerned, looks something like this. Then the actual labels you put on arts and so on can be different and different. Um, and one question that people have asked and that you come across fairly soon when you start looking at dependencies is, what constraints these trees uh, satisfy, and in particular, if they satisfy this constraint known as projectivity, which essentially asks whether, I mean, a tree is projective if every subtree covers a contiguous, uninterrupted part of the string of the sentence. Um, so uh, here is an example taken from English of a non-projective tree. So in this case, we have, in fact, two subtrees that don't satisfy this. So we have a subtree consist rooted at the word hearing, the noun, which consists of the phrase a hearing on the issue. And there's a sort of a gap in the middle there that is occupied by other material. And similarly, there is a subtree at, rooted at the, the, the verb or participle scheduled, which is scheduled today, which is also separated in this way. And of course, um, uh, you also know that most theoretical frameworks do not assume that dependency trees are necessarily uh, projective, even though they in many cases are. Uh, but as I put in parentheses, many parsers do make this assumption because it is a great simplifying assumption when you have to do parsing. So, um, but of course, the question is, how important is this phenomenon? And, and, and we can... Uh, well, there are different ways of thinking about this, but here are some simple statistics derived from some of the available sort of native dependency tree banks. Uh, most of them were also used in these, these Connell shared tasks. That sort of tells you for uh, eight different languages uh, in the column entitled sentences, how many, or rather how, how large a percentage of all the sentences in this tree bank uh, are annotated with a tree that is non-projective. And we see, that, okay, there's, there's a fair bit of variation here, and that probably depends both on properties of the language, but also, to some extent, properties of the style of annotation. So this is clearly both. But still, we see that it ranges from about 10% to over 25%. In this case, Basque being the, 
most non-projective language, if you can say such things. So this is clearly, at least to me, a non-negligible phenomenon in language, something that we need to care about. On the other hand, if you look at the final column here, which is the uh, percentage of dependencies, that is, of single dependency arc that actually connects to uh, create one of these discontinuities, uh, of course, the percentages are much smaller. So now ranging from about half a percent up to uh, 3% in, in, in the case of Basque. Uh, and that me this means, first of all, that uh, especially for statistical methods, this can be difficult to learn because statistical methods like to have many examples of the things that they want to learn. Secondly, and this is, uh, is why some studies can be a little deceptive, it also means uh, given the way we normally evaluate parsers, which is by a sort of an average, um, average amount of error or accuracy, if you like, averaged over all the data, but typically computed at the level of individual arcs and not of sentences, which means that it can be actually quite difficult to show a significant improvement by caring about these relatively rare phenomena. Right, so... Here then is the, the, after this introduction, is the plan uh, for the talk today. So essentially it consists of two parts. Uh, the first part, uh, in the first part I'm going to uh, present to you a particular approach to performing dependency parsing using uh, statistical methods that has become known as transition-based dependency parsing, which is a very simple uh, but robust and efficient uh, method for parsing, but which in its basic form, the, the form that I'm going to introduce first, is actually limited to projective trees. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to ask the question, how can we uh, extend the capabilities of such a system so that we can deal with these non-projective trees in an adequate manner? And I'm going to uh, um, uh, look at three different methods that have been proposed by different people for integrating this into the kind of transition-based framework that I will talk about first, and I will present some empirical, uh, uh, or rather a, one empirical study comparing these uh, three methods on a few different languages, not as many as in the Connell shared task, but uh, Czech will be one of them. So, so that's the plan. Okay, I can skip that. Uh, so. Transition-based dependency parsing, uh, the basic idea here is that we, first of all, define a transition system for dependency parsing. And a transition system is essentially an abstract state machine. So you can think of it, uh, for now anyway, as a finite state automaton. But a finite state automaton where every state has a rich complex internal structure rather than just being an atomic state that's in the... Um, and if we have such a system, a system that can take a sentence and then by passing through various states construct uh, a dependency tree for that sentence, then we can try to learn or train a statistical model for scoring possible transition. That is, given the, that the parser is in some state, we want this model to be able to tell us doing this particular parsing action is a bad idea. It has a low score. But doing this other parsing action is a good idea because it's given the evidence we have accumulated from the tree banks, it has a high score. Okay? Now, if we can do this, then we can actually uh, perform parsing then by using the statistical model, searching through this... Uh, uh, automaton for the optimal sequence of parsing action or transition sequence. So it's a sort of, in a way, it's an indirect and an abstract way of characterizing the parsing problem. But it has the advantage that you can implement it uh, sort of very efficiently. So you can get uh, parsers with, as I put here, low complexity, typically linear complexity. So the, the parsing time sort of grows with the length of the sentence only by a linear function, whereas most parsers for natural language would, would be at least cubic in, 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 in sentence length. But it also allows, as we shall see, uh, uh, rich history-based feature models, that is, uh, statistical models where the information from the entire parse history can be used in deciding what to do next. 
uh, which actually turns out to be uh, quite uh, a powerful idea for, for doing this ambiguation during parsing. There are several disadvantages as well, but I will let other people uh, point those out to you. I think some will be mentioned later on in the talk. So uh, just before uh, we go on, a little more formal notation uh, for talking about, uh, first of all, dependency trees themselves. So as I already say, we assume that the, the representation we want is a, is a tree. So given a sentence S consisting of some number of words and given some inventory of dependency labels, which is just L, then a dependency tree is a label-directed tree, uh, meaning that it consists of a set of nodes, and by convention, that set is denoted V, and every node is basically labeled with a word of the sentence. So we have exactly one node for each token of the sentence, plus this special dummy uh, word uh, that we typically prefix to the sentence. We then have a set of directed arcs, and these have labels, so we represent them as triples, consisting of, I have at the bottom here, a head word, a dependent word, and then a label signifying what kind of relation it is, whether it's the subject relation or the object relation or some other relation. Uh, and then, of course, and this is the only thing that makes them special as far as tree structures is concerned, we also have a linear precedence order on these nodes, reflecting the word order of the sentence. So it makes sense to ask whether a node comes before or after another one, which is something that you typically don't have in trees. Uh, and finally, we assume that the single unique root of this tree should be this special uh, dummy node. So that, that's what we want to achieve. Now, the next thing we need to do is to define uh, one of these transition systems. Uh, and I'm going to show you the, the simplest uh, possible one for projective dependency parsing. So in this system, a parser configuration or a parser state, I'm probably going to use those terms interchangeably. It's, 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 it's not. It consists of three things. So first of all, we have a stack. Uh, containing partially processed nodes. Uh, and I'm going to draw the stack so that it has its top to the right. So in this schematic notation, this is a stack containing some number of words, but this word W sub I is the word on top of the stack. We then have a queue uh, of remaining input nodes. So nodes we haven't processed yet. And I'm going to draw that so that it has its head or front to the left. I think this will be um, clear once I give some examples. So that's a queue with a W sub J at the front. And then the third thing that we have in a parser state is simply a set of labeled arcs in this triple notation. And they, of course, represent the partial dependency analysis that we have derived up to this point. Okay. Now, in order to start parsing, uh, we start in a configuration where we have only the zeroth word on the stack. And the zeroth word is this dummy word root, okay? And then we have all the nodes corresponding to the real words of the sentence lined up in the queue waiting to be processed. And we have an empty uh, arc set because we haven't built any structure yet. And we terminate when we reach a configuration where, again, we have only the special root node on the stack, we have an empty queue, meaning that we have processed all the nodes, and whatever arcs are then in this set A will define the parser output. OK, so that's, those are the configurations or states. Then we need some way of moving from one state to another, and, and that's what we call transition. So formally, you can think of them as functions, actually partial functions from configurations to configurations. And I've uh, represented them here as sort of in, a kind of inference rules. So whenever you have something corresponding to the condition above the rule, you can move to the configuration defined uh, below the rule. So the first transition here uh, I call left arc. Uh, and what it does is that it actually does two things. So given a configuration with at least two nodes on the stack, where uh, the, the second of those cannot be the special root node, because that would actually 
construct arcs going into the root node, and we don't want those. Given such a configuration, we can apply the left arc transition. And the effect is, first of all, adding a new arc to the, to the, to the analysis. And this arc has the rightmost word, the one on top of the stack, as the head, and the leftmost word as the dependent. So it will be an arc pointing to the left, if you like, hence the word left arc. Uh, in addition, of course, we have to choose an appropriate label here, but we can choose any label we like as far as the transition system is concerned. Now, the other effect that it has is to actually replace these two words by only the word that is the head of this arc. So essentially, we have two words. We say that this should be a dependent, so we attach it to the head, and only the head remains on the stack. Okay. Then we had, have the right arc transition, which is the exact mirror image of this. So again, we add an arc between the two words on top of the stack, but this time it will be an arc pointing to the right, and therefore the node that, that remains on the stack will be the one to the left, which is the head of this arc. And finally, we need a transition for taking the first word in the queue and pushing it onto the stack. And these three actions are the only ones that we need to be able to construct projective dependence. There are others. I mean, there are different variations of this, but it's one of the systems uh, with which you can parse projective trees. Now, I'm going to uh, imagine for about five minutes uh, that we have an oracle uh, an or so regardless of which configuration we're in for uh, any sentence, uh, we have an oracle that can tell us what is the right transition to apply at that point. So I'm representing this as a function of the configuration. If we had such an oracle, then of course parsing would be extremely simple. And in this particular system, it would be completely deterministic. All we would have to do would be to initialize the parser to this uh, start state that I showed before, and then as long as we're not in a terminal configuration, that is, as long as we uh, either have words left in the queue to process, or we have more than one node on the stack, we just ask the oracle what is the best thing to do. We call that T, then we apply T to our current configuration to get the new configuration. Now, eventually, we will fall out of this loop when we reach a terminal configuration, and whatever arcs we then have accumulated will define the output tree. Okay. Now, it, so far, oh, sorry, yes. Um, if you're still not convinced that we can actually construct a dependency trees in this way, I'm now going to try to convince you, I'm, and I hope I'm not going to block the view too much. So here's, a, at the top in this picture, you have the stack with the S and the Q, for parsing this sentence, economic news had little effect on financial markets. And at the bottom, I'm going to show how the dependency tree grows as we process this. So the first thing we have to do is to shift the first two words onto the stack. Uh, this uh, puts us in a position where we can add uh, the arc from news to economic because economic modifies news. So we apply a left arc transition, and this as you see at the bottom, has the effect of adding a labeled arc, but also removes the word economic from the stack because it had been attached to its head. We shift the verb, and we do another left arc transition, which attaches the subject to the verb. Uh, we then have to uh, shift, sorry, yeah, until we have little and effect on top of the stack, where we can add another left arc, uh, and we then have to shift all the way to financial markets. Um, we then do another left arc transition. And now we're in a position to, for the first time, do a right arc transition because we have the preposition on and we have the noun markets and markets should be a complement of on. So we do a right arc and then we attach on to effect and we attach effect to had we shift the final punctuation because in this particular example, unlike in the prog dependency tree bank, we attach the final punctuation to the verb. Uh, and then finally, we attach uh, the verb as the main predicate to the root. And now we have reached this terminal configuration where we have only the root node on the stack. We have an empty queue. And magically, by in the meantime, we have built up this tree. OK. So far, so good, I said. Um, 
what you can prove various things about this system. So one thing you can prove is that given an input sentence of length n, uh, provided that we have this oracle, the parser always terminates after exactly two n transitions. So this means that if every transition can be performed in some constant time, then the sort of parsing complexity here is linear in the length of the string, which is nice because it's arguably, well, I, I will come to that as well as we can do. Moreover, you can prove that the algorithm you get by combining this sort of oracle parsing with a transition system is both sound and complete for projective dependency trees. And what that means is that it's sound because any possible transition sequence that you can construct will give you a projective dependency tree and nothing else. It will not give you a fragmented tree. It will not give you a cyclic graph. It will give you a projective tree. And it's complete in the sense that for any projective tree that you can construct, there is always some transition sequence in the system that gives you exactly that tree. So it means that as long as we think we can represent syntax with projective trees, we can construct all the possible trees in this system. So in some sense, and this is a bit sort of, uh, you can argue that if the system is, is optimal in a couple of ways, it's robust because it never fails to produce an analysis. It's disambiguating because it never produces more than one analysis. Uh, and it's as efficient as can be, at least in terms of asymptotic complexity, because it does this in linear time. And it seems that any sort of uh, reasonable uh, parsing algorithm will at, le will at least have to look at each word in the sentence, and that alone takes linear time. Now, of course, all of this is based on this assumption made five minutes ago that we have an oracle that can help us predict the next transition. In, in the real world, oracles are hard to found, find, so we have to do something else. And the whole uh, thing then depends on, and in particular, what, with what accuracy we can parse sentences, depends on how well we can approximate this oracle using uh, machine learning. Uh, and the way we do this, there are different ways you can do this. But the way we, people normally do this is, uh, like uh, a lot of uh, statistical NLP these days, it uses a feature-based scoring function. So it's a scoring function over configurations and transitions. So this script S of C and T uh, is some way of measuring whether T is a good action to take in configuration C or not. And normally we assume that a high positive score means it's good, and a low, well, or a negative score or a lower score means it's, it's not so good. And the way we, the model for computing this score uh, then is typically uh, a linear classifier where we define a vector of features. So, so bold F here is a vector of features, of properties of the configuration and the transition that we think are relevant for determining whether it's good or bad. Uh, and the I here is just for the ith component of that vector. But then we also assume that we have learned uh, a weight for each feature. So features that indicate good transitions in combination with a particular configuration should have a high positive weight, and features that uh, indicate uh, bad transitions should have a low negative weight. So this is uh, sort of um, a very standard model in computational linguistics. Now, as I already said, one advantage of doing uh, this transition-based parsing is that unlike, in particular, so-called graph-based dependency parsers that rely on dynamic programming, uh, we have no restrictions, basically no restrictions on the kind of features we can use. Um, so we can have these uh, uh, history-based models where we can define features over arbitrary input tokens in this, on the stack and in the queue, we can, very importantly, because this is really hard in dynamic programming, define features over the partial dependency tree that we have built so far, so whether a particular word already has a subject attached to it or not. Uh, and we can even, uh, although this is something that we don't do so often, we can define features over the, all the transitions that we have uh, com composed so far. So, Without going into a lot of details, here's an attempt at showing you what, what are the typical features that we would look at in such a system. 
So what I first call basic features is that we will typically look at the part of speech, the word form, and typically also the combination of the two for a number of words, perhaps two, three, four typically, uh, on both the stack and the queue. So this will give us the sort of local configurations of words that we're looking at. We will also look at the part of speech, the word form, and the dependency labels for any dependents that have already been attached to, in particular, these two words on top of the stack, which are the ones that we're looking at trying to decide whether there should be an arc between them. That's a very important. Uh, and then there are many other things. The distance between whether they were in the original string adjacent or far apart can be important. Uh, what I call the left and right va valency, I should probably ex excuse my use of the term valence. What this really means uh, is a very crude thing usually, namely how many things does S, how many dependents, uh, just the number, does S1 and S2 have to the left and the right at this point in time. But we can also look at the whole set of dependency labels that are. And then in addition to that, but this is partly dependent on the kind of machine learning you use, but if you just use the simple linear classifiers I showed you, then it's also typically very important to combine these basic features into pairs and triples in all sorts of ways. And I don't think actually I will, uh, I'll be happy to talk uh, more about this afterwards if someone is especially interested. But the idea is that we can have a lot of features. Typically, because these, uh, in order to fit into this linear classifier framework, they also have to be binarized. So it's not uncommon to have certainly hundreds of thousands and even millions of features in such a model. Question is then, how can we then learn the weights for this? How can we learn which features are indicators of good transitions and, and, and which are indicators of bad transition? And essentially, uh, there are sort of two main approaches that have been taken to this. The traditional one, which was pioneered by um, Yamada and Matsumoto, uh, and, and is to do what is known as a local optimization. That is, we try basically try to, uh, instead of having this oracle function, we try to simply take the highest scoring transition in each configuration. We only try to learn this very local thing. Given a configuration and ignoring the rest of the derivation, can we predict the best one? Uh, and we then can do inference or parsing by only choosing the one best uh, transition at each decision point. So this is a completely greedy deterministic parser. Um, more recently, uh, people have shown that just using a single one best like that can, of course, lead to search errors. And because of those errors, you can make additional errors with something that is often called error propagation. So recently, people have looked at an alternative way of learning these models that involve global optimization, where instead you try to learn uh, a way of maximizing the accuracy over the entire sequence of transitions that is required to derive an entire tree. And you plug in this instead of the parse function. Um, and this is typically combined then with so-called beam search, where instead of just taking the single one best transition out of each configuration, we explore uh, a, a, a set of let k uh, configurations. Uh, but not all of them. And as long as this k is some constant, we will still have sort of linear time complexity in doing this. Okay, so summing up so far, um, transition-based dependency parsing is efficient thanks to having low parsing complexity and can be relatively accurate thanks to having these rich non-local features that are not available in all other approaches. And uh, especially when combined with this global optimization uh, technique, uh, it can sort of lead to state-of-the-art uh, parts. So we had a paper at ACL this summer where we showed that for English, with a conversion of the pen tree bank that only has projective dependency trees, uh, this is, uh, gives you the, exactly the same level of accuracy as, a, as, as the best alternative approaches in other, which is roughly 93% uh, unlabeled accuracy just looking at the uh, arcs of the, of the tree. However, everything I showed you so far 
is limited to projective dependency trees. How can we sort of extend this so we also deal with these discontinuous constructions, which um, can be linguistically uh, very important. Now, the first thing to note, and I alluded to this in the introduction, is that parsing with arbitrary non-projective trees is a much harder problem than restricting it to projective trees. So there are a number of theoretical results in the literature, I'm not going to go through them, that shows that doing exact parsing, that is computing the highest scoring tree if you allow arbitrary non-projective trees, is computationally intractable, meaning that it cannot be performed in polynomial time except under very restricted assumptions. Even if you do the kind of greedy deterministic parsing that you tend to do in transition-based parsing, you can prove that we can, we can parse any projective tree in linear time, but if we allow arbitrary non-projective trees, it's going to take n squared time. And of course, the, not of course, but one way of looking at the source of the difficulty is that the if, if you allow any non-projective tree, it means that the word order of the sentence is completely unconstrained by the tree structure. Now, I, I think there are very few natural languages where, where that is actually the case, but mathematically speaking, if you don't make any restrictions on these. So essentially, all permutations of all in this linear order of all trees are okay, from a formal point of view at least. Uh, another way to look at it is that, I mean, this naturally gives rise to this uh, phenomenon of discontinuity, where you have trees, you can build a new subtree from any sort of discontinuous uh, component. You can basically take them from anywhere in the string. And this, of course, combinatorially is very bad. So what can we do? Well, here are three things that uh, me and some other people have thought about. Uh, so the first uh, is what we call pseudo-projective parsing, which essentially is a way of trying to hide the problem from the parser. So we pre-process the training data so that it's formally projective, and we then apply a post-processing to the parser output. The second one, which was, as far as I know, first proposed by Giuseppe Attardi in one of the Connell shared tasks, is to add additional transitions to the system that can actually co combine um, elements that are not adjacent on the stack. You may have noticed that both the left arc and the right arc could only combine things that were adjacent on the stack. And the third idea that I have explored more recently is to also extend the transition system, by not, but, but not by new elements for constructing arcs, but with uh, actually usually a single transition that allows you to uh, do word order permutations so that we can uh, make the tree projective in a way. So starting with pseudo-projective parsing, uh, as a, the, the, the key idea here, and that is actually uh, an old idea that sort of uh, other people have shown. I, I think there's uh, well, one of the references that uh, probably should have had near now, Kahan, uh, Nasser, and Rambo, I think, ACL 97 or 98 that you can, you can represent, you can, you can give an approximate representation of a non-projective tree by a tree that is formally speaking projective, uh, but where you then encode information about the non-projectivity in the labels instead. So, and the way we can construct such a tree is that given a non-projective tree, I have a very simple tree from English here, like who did you see, where who is a dependent on the main verb see, which creates a non-projectivity. We know that if this word has an incoming arc that is non-projective, and we know that we can always make the tree projective by instead attaching this higher up in the tree. In the very worst case, we may have to attach it all the way to the root node. But, so, but you can think of it, I mean, if we trivially, trivially, if we attach all the words to the root node, that is, of course, projective. So we try to make the minimal transformation where we attach it uh, higher, but only as much as we have to. So in this case, it's enough to go a single step up in the tree and attach it to the auxiliary did instead. So now we have a projective tree. But of course, it's not an adequate linguistic representation because what, who 
arguably is not the object of the auxiliary did, but of the main verb see. So what can we do? Well, in this approach, we put in a little extra information in the label. Uh, and you can imagine different encoding schemes here, some more informative than others, but we also need to have something that we can actually learn from data. So in fact, in many cases, we do something very simple. We just add an additional element here uh, with the label on the incoming arc of the true parent or head of this word. So this complex label says something like, I'm an object, uh, and I should really be attached lower in the tree than I'm, I am right now. And if you're looking for my real parent, look for something that has an incoming arc with this label. Now, this is an approximate coding because in the general case with complex trees, there may not be a single parent satisfying that criterion. So going from non-projective to pseudo-projective is completely deterministic, but going back can be non-deterministic. Now, in this, the, the, but the idea in data-driven parsing is that we first of all transform all the training data so that it looks like this. And then we can train our projective parser just as before. And the parser will not notice anything except possibly that some, some arcs have funny labels, right? And then if the parser actually manages to produce the correct pseudo-projective structure, then we can apply an approximate inverse transformation. And we typically do something very simple. We just do a left to right breadth first search down the tree until we find a matching parent. And in this simple example, of course, that is going to produce the correct result. So we will be able to construct this back. But in a more complex tree where possi possibly something has been extracted out of a lower subordinate clause, we might go wrong. And of course, there's no guarantee that the parser will produce the right label in the first place. So this can go wrong in, in many ways. But that's one way in which you can do it. Second idea, extended arc transitions. So in this case, we start with exactly the same system I have before, but then we add two new transitions for adding left arc and right arc. And they look exactly like the, the first left arc and right arc, except that the nodes that we combine are no longer adjacent, but we allow them to have an intervening node here. And that intervening node is not affected by the transition. It stays where it was, but the dependent is, again, removed. So using this kind of, we can now parse this tree. We start uh, parsing just like before, and up until this point, uh, we haven't done anything that we couldn't do before. But now, when we shift the word verb, word C, we're in a position where we would really like to add an arc from C to who. But in the original system, we cannot do that because they are not adjacent. Uh, and there is no way in we can get rid of did. But now, our system allows us to do this, provided there is only one thing in between. And you can, of course, generalize this and allow two or three. So now we can apply this new left arc transition that gives us this funny uh, representation. And once we have done that, uh, everything can proceed as normal again, and we build the entire tree. OK. Third idea. Instead of adding new, because you can actually show that in the previous system, if you really want to be able to parse all non-projective trees, you may have to add an infinite number of transitions because there's, theoretically speaking, there is no bound on the number of things that can be intervening. So here's in, here is in some way a simpler idea. Give the parser the, the possibility of permuting words instead. So this op transition called swap says that if we have two things on top of the stack where this second thing cannot be the root again because we don't want the root in the middle of the sentence. Uh, we can permute their order, and for technical reasons, we do this by taking the se second element and moving it back to the queue. The idea is that we want the top of the stack to be the same before and after this transition. Now, with this addition, we can also parse this sentence. And just as before, everything is just as in the projective system until we come to this point. Now we have the word who in this possible swap position. And because we want to bring who into sort of contact with C, we can now apply a swap operation, which sort of um, 
changes the order here. And then we can move these words onto the stack and look now, C and who are suddenly adjacent on the stack, even though they were not adjacent in the original input string. So we can now use an ordinary left arc transition to add this arc that we added in the previous system. And just as before, from this on, nothing special is required. So th these are sort of two different techniques for dealing with this. Now, you can, you can compare these theoretically, uh, and you can note that, as I already hinted, this final, well, I didn't say that, but this final idea with swap is complete in the sense that in this system you can construct any non-projective tree. Um, Whereas in the other systems, there are, there are cases you cannot. I mean, in this extended arc transition, it's the case that you may have to require two or three or four things uh, between the two words. And in the other one, it's because this inverse mapping is not exact. If you look at parsing complexity, uh, you can show that this adding this swap actually changing the parsing complexity. So the worst case is now uh, n squared, even though you can, you can show that for the kind of data that occur in natural language, it's still for all practical purposes linear. In the other case is, of course, no, not of course. In, in the first case, of course, because we don't change the parsing system, it remains linear. I put a little star there to remind me that actually, theoretically speaking, the post-processing step is now, now takes n squared time. But again, it's usually much faster than the actual parsing in practice. So it doesn't. Uh, and here it, it remains. Uh, of course, in the pseudo-projective case, we have the extra complication that we have to post-process the parser output, whereas in these two systems. So there are pros and cons sort of with, with, with all of these ideas. Of course, a very interesting question is, how do they work empirically when we apply them to natural language? Do they actually improve the accuracy of the parser compared to the projective baseline? Now, until very recently, even though all of these three methods have been used and evaluated, they had not been sort of systematically compared. So together with my colleague Marco Kuhlmann in Uppsala, we performed a little study where we, where we looked at, first of all, what we call theoretical coverage. That is, if you have one of these oracles, uh, how, how large part of the trees in a, in a typical tree bank can you actually parse? And then, which is... The, the more, I guess, from practical point of view, at least the more impo uh, interesting, namely, what kind of empirical performance can you get when you train parser models? We decided to use three data sets from the um, Connell 2009 uh, shared task, um, which, because, which were sort of reasonably large, but also had some interesting differences between them, so that we could see how these these methods performed with different types. So uh, the languages were Czech, English, and German. And I should say for English, because I said before that we had evaluation results with only projective trees. But in this conversion, uh, the conversion to dependencies for English actually took into account the empty categories and co-indexation in the original pen tree bank, uh, which in some case actually results in non-projective dependencies. Uh, we implemented all of these three methods in, in the malt parser system so that we can, could compare them using sort of uh, similar feature models and, and, and machine learning algorithms. Now, here are some statistics about the tree banks, more precisely the training sets. Uh, and uh, the first column is the percentage of sentences with a non-projective tree. And as expected, both for Czech and German, we have quite a few of those. So 25% plus minus uh, um, 3% approximately. But for English, we have much fewer. And this is probably partly due to the annotation, but at least we have a sort of fair proportion of them. If we look at the percentage of non-projective arcs, uh, we see essentially the same uh, sort of differences. So for Czech and German, there are about 2% non-projective arcs for English, there is only about half a percent. So we can expect that it will be diff more difficult to learn how to find these things in English because we have less data to learn from. On the other hand, it will hurt the performance less because they don't occur so often. Uh, one of the interesting things that actually I wasn't aware of until this study is if you look at the average length of a non-projective dependency, it turns out that for Czech, the average length of a non-projective dependency is actually quite short. It's 4.5 words. I mean, measured in this simple way just by, uh, 
I guess it's the, it, it, the position of the one minus the position of the other. So it's, a, so it's that, that's not how many words are in between. It's how many words are in between plus one, right? I think so. But anyway, I mean, you can compare it with the average length for projective sentences and see that, yes, they are slightly longer, but not much. If you compare this with German, there's a drastic difference. So uh, you can tell me uh, sort of the linguistic analysis behind this, but I mean, at least superficially, it looks like in German, non-projective dependencies are much more caused by these long-distance uh, relations that you get from verb final or other kinds of constructions. Whereas in Czech, they seem to at least maybe a, a large part of them be the result of more local um, permutations, perhaps having to do with information structure. English is somewhere in between, but actually closer to, to German than to Czech. And we will see that this actually is significant later on. So here are the, the sort of theoretical coverage, and there's no real surprise here. So we find what we should find. So if we use the, this swap system with a perfect oracle, we can actually parse everything in all the tree banks uh, because it can produce any non-productive tree. But if we use one of the two approximate methods, we can still parse most of the things. And compared to the projective baseline, especially, oh, I should say, there are two evaluation metrics here. The LAS stands for Labeled Attachment Score, which is the most commonly used. And that just looks at individual labels, how many of the, sorry, individual arcs, how many of the individual arcs were parsed correctly, including the label that's labeled. The LAEM is the labeled exact match. That is how many sentences or what, what percentage of sentences got uh, an exactly correct uh, tree with all the arcs and all the labels. And here we see, of course, that as expected, for example, for German, we can still get most of the dependencies, but we can only get about 73% of the trees. But we, even with the approximate methods, this brings us much closer to 100%. So there is definitely a, a, a potential for improvement here. If instead we go to the empirical performance, that is when we actually train scoring functions and use them with these three systems, what happens? Um, and looking first at this overall accuracy, labeled attachment score and labeled exact match. And what we find here is essentially two patterns, I would say. The first pattern is that uh, in order to get a significant improvement in accuracy when measured over all sentences and all dependencies, you need to, uh, non-projective dependencies need to be frequent enough. So for check where you have frequent, you do have a significant improvement for all three methods over the projective baseline. For German, you have it for at least two of the methods. Uh, and of course, the difference is, I mean, in, in absolute terms, larger in the uh, exact match score, but, but it's sort of the statistical significance le level is in fact about the same. Now, but for English, well, yes, some of the scores improve a little, but they are not statistically significant. And this is probably the co combined effect of sort of having, uh, having sort of too few examples. Well, it's, I, I, I should say it's, it's primarily the effect of having too few instances in the test set for the difference to be statistically significant. Now, the interesting thing is that the extended arc method, uh, while being actually probably the best one for check, uh, actually decreases performance for English and partially also for German. And I think this is clearly a reflection of the fact that non-projective dependencies tend to be longer in these languages. And this uh, capacity of only allowing a single node in between two means that there are a number of things that get blocked in that. So it seems that the other two methods are sort of more robust in the sense that they either improve accuracy or don't affect it. Whereas in, uh, in, the, in the presence of many long dependencies, you can actually hurt your performance by using this extended arc methods. Um, if we zoom in and only look at the non-projective arcs to try to find out sort of how these methods do on the things that they were designed to do, some further interesting patterns arise. Uh, so what I, what I have here are uh, two measures. The first is labeled precision on non-projective arcs output by the parser. So what that means that any 
arc that was non-projective in the output of the parser. How often was that uh, a correct arc or not? And then we have labeled recall, which means for any arc that was non-projective in the tree bank, in the gold standard, how often did the parser actually find that arc? And these are a bit funny because they're not really the usual precision and recall because one thing that you may note from the first row is that some of the non-projective arcs in the gold standard can actually be found sort of by accident by a projective parser. It produces a projective tree where a projective arc happens to be the same as a non-projective arc in the gold standard. Of course, that necessarily implies that there is an error somewhere else because otherwise it, 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 it wouldn't be projective. So what we see here, of course, is unsurprisingly, uh, the projective parser doesn't produce any non-projective arcs, so precision is undefined. It finds a few, sort of by accident. But if you look at the other methods, of course, they do considerably better. And if we start by looking at precision, it's actually interesting to see that precision is quite high, given that these are relatively rare and uh, especially for English and German, tend to be longer than the average projective. And we know that all parsers do worse on longer dependencies, whether they are projective or non-projective. So for Czech, we actually have precision figures between 75 and 80%, which is only slightly lower than we have for projective dependencies. Projective dependencies would be, well, uh, so this is, well, somewhere... Well, I have, I have the figures if you want to know. I mean, over 80 anyway, probably close to 85 here. But still, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a smaller gap than I expected. For English and German, um, it's um, lower, but still, I would say, quite reasonable for these. Because actually, here we cannot sort of, because these tend to be longer, we should really <coughs> compare the precision for projective arcs of the same length. I haven't done that in detail, but I would suspect that it wouldn't be uh, uh, such a large difference. We see that, in, that the swap system in this case tends to have the lowest precision. Well, not for, for check, actually, but in the two other cases, which, which might indicate that it sort of over-predicts these to some extent. But still, in all cases, it's well over 50%, which sort of given the standard for non-projective parsing is not bad. When we look at recall, we see that it's generally lower. So there are a number of sort of non-projective arcs that can simply not be found by either of the system. Uh, and we also we see again that figures are relatively speaking higher for Czech and lower for German and English. And they, they are very similar for German and English. So we see that this frequency effect doesn't seem to play a large role here. I mean, it, it plays a role in the sense that the improvement on overall accuracy is not so note, but if we look at how well they're actually doing on the non-projective arcs, they seem to be similar. So it seems to be more that because the non-projective arcs tends to be longer in these languages, we get lower recall than we get for instance. Check. Right, so I think I actually said most of these things, but just to summarize what we see from this empirical study. In terms of overall parsing accuracy, uh, we pretty much see a significant improvement for all methods, provided that non-projective dependencies are frequent enough, which they are in Czech and German, but not in English. Uh, if we look specifically at non-projective dependencies, the one we targeted, we see that precision is relatively high and sometimes almost equivalent to what we find for projective dependencies, which is interesting. Whereas recall is generally a little lower and also seems to be more <laughs> language dependent or, or maybe annotation dependent, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, and if we compare methods, I, I was actually surprised myself that the results were so similar. I had expected to see larger differences. Uh, but I, I guess one sort of finding worth mentioning is that it seems that this extended arc method is a little more unreliable in the sense that it can actually, uh, under some conditions, uh, um, result in, in an overall decrease in accuracy. So, um, just to conclude, uh, I've, I've tried to show you how, uh, by using transition-based methods, we can do efficient parsing using either completely greedy deterministic inference or uh, beam search. And um, the advantage that this gives us are these unconstrained history-based feature models. I've then looked at three different ways of um, dealing with non-projective dependencies within this kind of framework. 
Um, and we, I guess the main conclusion from that empirical study is that all three methods seem to give reasonably high precision and, and somewhat lower recall. But still, uh, we, we do manage to find quite a few of the non-projecting dependencies that we wouldn't otherwise. I think there are several interesting directions to go with this, uh, apart from just improving the methods, of course. Uh, I think I, sh I should add that in the first part of the talk, I said that with global optimization, we can get state-of-the-art accuracy for projective parsing. The study I presented in the, in, in the second part was not with global optimization. That was so the sort of locally optimized, uh, greedy, uh, sort of classical transition-based approach. And it's, it's actually possible that one or more of these methods could actually uh, benefit from doing the global optimization with beam search. In particular, I would suspect that this swap operation, which actually sort of increases the number of possible transition sequences, could actually benefit from doing that. But, but that's still future work. Of course, it, the comparison of different techniques have been sort of limited to the transition-based framework here. There are also uh, uh, other uh, several other approaches to dependency parsing where people have also looked at ways of incorporating non-projective dependencies. So it would be also interesting to sort of extend the empirical analysis to see whether there are possibly interesting differences there in terms of the kind of dependencies that different methods uh, can analyze correctly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for most, I would say, clear um, talk, um, even for the, those who are linguists, uh, I mean, primarily and mainly, I think that we could see how you proceeded from one uh, step to another step. So thank you very much on behalf of those. <laughs> and now I would like to open uh, discussion. Please, uh, I was instructed again uh, that I should pass over the microphone to the speaker. Hello, thanks for uh, the nice summarizing as well as the uh, detailed talk. And uh, I have uh, two questions, in fact. Uh, Sorry, as well as uh, details. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, the first one was, um, uh, do you know this measure of uh, number of gaps in non-projective sentences? So, so is the number of swap operations related to the number of gaps in any sense or in way? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, um, so, so it's interesting. I mean, uh, there, there have been several attempts. I mean, if you look at the ways, so um, let, let me step, step back a bit and put that into context. I mean, there have been several attempts of trying to define a class of mildly non-projective dependencies, because it seems that if we allow all non-projective trees, the parsing problem becomes very hard. And if we look at tree banks, it seems clear that we don't need all non-projective trees, because after all, there, there is some regularity. And, and having this idea of bounded gap degree, which essentially says that in, a, in one of these discontinuous trees, you can have no more than one gap or two gaps have been one such characterization. Uh, and then and then on the other hand, people have come up with parsing algorithms that can parse um, some but not all non-projective. And we saw two examples here, the, the pseudo-projective and the... Uh, now, interestingly or perhaps frustratingly or disappointingly or something, it, it has been hard to map these to each other. So on the one hand, we have the theoretical considerations, but no one has a... the theoretical definitions, but no one has a parsing algorithm that can use that. On the other hand, we have these parsing algorithms, but no one knows what set of trees they actually compute. It's not completely true, because people have developed parsing algorithms for bounded gap degree, but not in a transition-based framework. It's a graph-based. Uh, the swap system, of course, as I said, is allows unbounded gap degree in itself, because it, because it can parse any non-projective sentence. And, and, and we know that so it, 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 it clearly by itself cannot be equivalent to any of, 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 of those systems. Question is whether the 
number of swap operations that you need to perform is somehow related to the number of gaps that you have or to, to the maximal number of gaps. Um, I think it's... I would conjecture that it's not. And it's based on some very indirect evidence. So I think you can show um, that the number of consecutive swaps, not the number of total swaps, because that might simply depend on how many discontinuous structures, and in a large sense you can have discontinuous structures that don't interact. But the number of consecutive swaps without any other seems to be related to the number of nodes uh, or, or number of subtrees that you have under a non-projective arc, uh, which is sort of related to the extended arc transition. So the simple extended arc transition only allows one, but of course you can increase that. Uh, so that seems to be related to a notion called arc degree, which I proposed uh, five years ago. And I think my colleague Marco Kuhlmann has shown that there is no relation between arc degree and gap degree so that you can have unbounded arc degree with limited gap degree and vice versa. So there are several steps along this uh, argument that have to be checked and, and have to be proven. But, but based on that, I would actually guess that it's not. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, and now the second question that was, um, if you could combine the swap and the extended transition uh, into one uh, setup, because uh, my uh, guess is that in for some languages and in some situations, uh, predicting the swap would be easier and more reliable, uh, and in other situations, uh, predicting the uh, extended transition might be easier. But mm. this will certainly make the training harder, so. Right. Now, no, that, that's, that's, that's a, another very, I mean, of course, uh, in, in, in some sense, it's trivial to do it. I mean, you can just write up the transition system that has all the transition that I showed in this talk, and, and that's it, it's a perfectly well-defined transition system. What, of course, what you do is that you increase the amount of what we might call, borrowing a term from, from other frameworks, spurious ambiguity in the sense that there would now, I mean, I showed you how the extended arc transition parser parsed who did you see. I also showed you how the swap extended parser parsed it. Now, if we have a system that has both, you could, you could do either one. And, 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 and first of all, how should we train the parsers? Should we teach it to have certain preferences, prefer the extended arc transition if the, the dependency is short enough, and only swap if you have to. I mean, that sounds like a reasonable strategy. Uh, what would actually happen empirically if you try to implement that, and whether the parser could actually learn such preferences, or whether it would simply be confused uh, sort of by, by having too many alternatives to shows from. I mean, even with the, just introducing the swap itself, you're actually doing this, because there, there's actually, for, for, for many non-projective dependencies, there are um, several transition sequences that give the same tree, uh, because, um, well, no, I, I, I won't go through into. And if, if, you're, if, if someone is interested, we can talk offline about that. But it, it basically has to do with uh, you can swap early or late, and, and, and you can do it in different orders. And actually, um, figuring out the optimal transition <coughs> sequence. For a, for a non-projective sentence where optimal means the one that has the fewest swap is a very hard problem, uh, something that I haven't yet figured out an efficient solution for a sol uh, efficient algorithm for solving. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think it might, I, I think you might need perhaps a different kind of learning method for, for doing this, where you possibly allow not just Lie on, lie on this oracle idea that there is a single best analysis, but you actually allow several. Thank you very much. In the first example you showed, uh, the system is defined differently than in your book, uh, which is called Arc Eagle algorithm, where it takes one node from a stack and one from uh, the queue. Yep. Is there another reason than for just didactic <laughs> that it's easier to explain one of those? Yeah, th there are actually two reasons. Uh, you, you may have noticed, well, maybe 
there, there are, that's one. So, that, so that okay. So there are two differences. The, the first is that I showed you an Arc standard system rather than an Arc eager system. Um, so you may have noticed when I did the first parsing examples that I actually had to do all the left arc first and then I did all the right arcs in reverse, which is a typical property of the, and, and I personally prefer the arc eager because it's incremental. You always add arcs at the earliest possible opportunity. The problem is that it's not trivial to combine the arc eager strategy with uh, the swap operation. Uh, and moreover, when Giuseppe Attardi first proposed his extended uh, arc transition, he based that on the arc standard and not the arc eager. So for both those reasons, uh, since, I was, since I more or less had to use the arc standard in the second part of the talk, it seemed more natural to start with that. Now, the other thing, the reason I, I moved to this uh, stack-based is that it's much, it's, it's much easier to enforce the tree constraint. Uh, in, in the, in the arc eager algorithm, we typically have the termination condition only that the queue is empty. But you can have any number of, um, uh, items on the stack because you, when you add a right arc, you shift things onto the stack. So you can have, you may still have a tree, but, but you're not guaranteed. I mean, in this kind of, when you do it in this way on the stack, then if you change the termination condition to in addition to requiring an empty queue, you also require exactly one node on the stack, then you guarantee that the output is a tree. So it's, uh, so the theoretical results for soundness and completeness are a little bit cleaner in that sense. So that, that also made sense, but I, I maybe should have commented on this. Because it actually turns out that for the arc eager system, you cannot prove, it, it isn't sound and complete for, it's complete for, not for projective trees, but it's sound only for projective forests, which are sets of trees. Maybe a related question. Uh, the way how to handle it is to do another iteration, to run it once again, and the forest will be transferred probably to another forest or a tree final as it was done in Matsumoto original yes, experiment. Yes. Do you think this is a better way or has it some advantages over just one iteration? I, I think, I think, I mean, the, the argument that, I mean, the reason why uh, Yamada and Matsumoto defined it in that way was essentially that they thought that, um, um starting with local dependencies uh, and trying to do the more distant ones only when you had done all the local ones would increase accuracy because by and large the shorter more local dependencies parses tend to be more accurate there and if you try to predict those so so even though it's not really built into their model they just do as many passes as they I mean the, the philosophy behind it was that on the first pass you would perhaps only connect adjacent words and on the second pass you attach things that you get from the small trees that you get, and then you move on. Now, this idea has been developed much further by, especially you have Goldberg, who has proposed this easy first parser, where essentially you don't go left to right at all, but you basically, you start with all the sentences and you score all possible dependencies, and the one for which you have the highest confidence score, uh, no matter where it is in the tree, you just add that, and then you, so you have a priority queue, and so you may do one here, one there, one there, instead of sort of iterating. Uh, and, 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 and it seems that that can sometimes improve accuracy. I think the reason I chose not to do it that when I started with the Arc Eager system that, uh, is that I, I was interested in, in having a, a, an incremental parser, a parser that could sort of parse from left to right, building structure as early as possible, uh, and, and where you could sort of stop it at any point and have a partial analysis of the, um, uh, which might be interesting from the point of view, let's say, of psycholinguistic modeling, which, because that, as far as I know, seems to be the way the human sentence processing. But, of course, if your main motivation is to have as high accuracy as possible in practical application, it's, it's, it's not important. I have one trivial uh, linguistic observation and one uh, maybe naive question. Uh, the trivial observation is that uh, 
Well, you said that linguists may uh, give some more substantiation of the difference of the lengths of okay. the arcs. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> that's the naive observation um, or trivial observation of interpreters from uh, a German to Czech uh, that the uh, interpreters uh, complain that they have to wait too long to get the German verb mm -hmm. uh, before they put the Czech words in the right forms. Mm -hmm. So they have to wait to uh, hear the verb mm -hmm. and then they can uh, accommodate mm -hmm. the Czech uh, forms. So that's the length of the right, arcs. Right. Uh, the naive question is, um, when you compare um, the methods as you did uh, German, English and Czech, mm -hmm. how much influence uh, is there of the set of features? You spoke about the basic features. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can imagine that, for instance, the part of speech uh, features or um, uh, the, the, the marks uh, are different for Czech and English mm -hmm. and German. So how would that influence, for instance, the comparison of the three methods or mm -hmm. would that have no influence whatsoever. Yeah, th I mean, th that's, uh, I mean, to, to comment on the first thing, I mean, I, I, I do think the, I mean, with what I know about German, I'm not a, I'm, I never studied German, but I, I mean, I can understand some German. I mean, this idea of, of having this, these uh, verb placement and so seems to be at least part of a plausible uh, explanation for why you have these longer dependencies there. Uh, exactly sort of what, uh, and, and you don't have similar structures in Czech, I understand it, and therefore you don't have at least not uh, the, the same length. Of, uh, for, the, for the features, yes, this is, this is really tricky because uh, you, you want to, as I said, I mean, the, the idea here, even though we were not primarily interested in concerning the languages, though in other context we might be. Here we were primarily interested in, in comparing sort of three different methods for handling non-projective dependencies. And we wanted to have more than one language because languages pose different challenges. And to some extent it was visible in the results. So, so in that sense it's not, it's not maybe a, 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 but in any such event uh, when, you're, uh, when you're using these sort of feature-based classifiers you know that what features you select can be very important. And the question is, um, so in many, of the, in, in many of these experiments, whether you're interested in comparing different methods on the same data or the same method on different data, what does it mean to make a fair comparison? Now, one argument might say, well, a fair comparison is to give all methods the same features. That seems fair. But on the other hand, it may be the case that methods have different capacities for using these features. So it may be that one method is such that it can um, cope with a much richer feature representation than another. And then it suddenly seems unfair not to give that method the possibility. So then you might say, well, we should not have the same feature. We should have the best features for each model because then we compare the methods at their best. And that's the most interesting because when we want to use these methods, of course, we want to use them at their best and not at some sort of average level where they use the same feature as some other method. But of course, um, finding the best features for each model in combination with each language and so on is a really hard problem. So we never know whether we have really, uh, I mean, we, we, we certainly tried in all these experiments to for each of the methods and each of the language by running s s several experiments trying to optimize the features as well as we could uh, for each of the um, settings. But there is really no way of proving that we succeeded in doing this. And it's possible because typically you start from some, I mean, you start from a model that you know has worked in the past and you make some, some uh, simple modifications to that and you see, well, this thing works, this thing doesn't, and after a while you're satisfied that nothing you can think of seems to work any better. But maybe we're just being unimaginative and maybe something completely unexpected would change the picture. So it is a very relevant question, certainly not naive. Uh, and and um, 
I, I do think that the, the sort of this, this comparison is relatively uh, fair, at least on the methods. I'm, I'm, I'm less sure about sort of comparisons between languages because that was not our focus here, but uh, it certainly makes a difference. Well, we still have time for one question. Yes, please. Uh, is, there, is there any uh, search tool or for searching non-projective dependency trees in the tree bank? Oh, for searching? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, maybe there are... Uh, we, we, have, we have a simple evaluation tool uh, that we uh, called Multival that we um, developed for evaluating parsing results. Um, and so it's not primarily a search tool, but it does allow you to visualize uh, dependency trees, both the parser output and the gold standard and with some color coding that shows you where the errors are. And, and, and in that tool, you can also make some simple searches. You can search for different parts of speech or dependency labels. And one thing you can actually also search for there are uh, non-projective um, dependency arcs. Uh, but there may be other tools available. I don't know. I'm sure there are people in the audience who could help me here. Uh, in three, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought so. Thank you.